Okay, I think I've admitted all the participants. So um, hello everyone and welcome to Leo and I's panel, which is called uh, Twin Flame, the reception of British cinema among Chinese audience. Um, so now we're just going to give a short introduction to you. So, um, sorry, let me just mute something. Um, my name's Lily Collinson and I'm a Chinese studies and Spanish studies student um, at Lancaster University. And um, at UK China Film Co Lab, I am the um, lead literary curator and publicist. So my project for this year has been creating um, a, a cross-cultural journal, a uh, film journal using reviews from British and Chinese students. And the title of my journal is um, Twin Flames. So we use this name for the panel because um, it's kind of about... Oh, sorry, can someone mute please? Um, sorry about that. Um, yeah, it's about the uh, kind of um, connection between China and the UK that runs deeply within uh, our two nations. Um, so Leo, would you now like to introduce yourself? Okay, thank you, Lily. Hi, everyone. I'm Leo. And I'm a postgraduate student in the University of Edinburgh. And my major is film directing, um, basically the uh, documentary. Um, I joined the UCFC UK China Film Club as an uh, international film producer and uh, community lead uh, 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 curator. And for this panel, I do the translation and do some discussion. And um, yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you, Lily. And I forgot to add that Leo has kindly uh, done all the translations for this presentation. So all the reviews have been translated by Leo. Okay, um, so I'm just going to give a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about today. So, as I said, Twin Flame is about a connection between China and the UK and how we can reinforce this through a mutual appreciation of cinema. And um, we will be discussing, uh, well, setting out a parameter for success as to how what makes a Chinese, a British film successful in China. Uh, then we'll be analyzing films using the reviews translated by Leo and other forms of data. And then Leo and I will be discussing the films and evaluating this, their success. And finally, we'll be, we will be finishing with an audience Q&A. So in terms of the parameter, uh, parameter for success, um, of course, we've got the ratings and reviews from Doban. Um, but also we're going to be talking about competition um, because in China, there's only 34 foreign films allowed to be released per year. So as you can imagine for British filmmakers, they're up against um, Hollywood and every other international film producer. So um, it can be quite tough to come out on top against everyone else. Um, and we're also going to talk a bit about the timing of the films, um, according to if it's released near a national holiday or if it's released at the same time as a Chinese film and how that can impact the success. And also a little bit about political correctness, because recently in China, there's been a lot of government campaigns addressing this. Um, and it's important to not um, cause any offence or um, yeah, and then finally about, we're going to be talking about um, how, how a film resonates with an audience according to their shared culture and their shared history. Um, so firstly, we're going to be talking about 1917, which was directed by Sam Mendes. And as you can see on the right, I've included a photo of the uh, Chinese film poster for this film which we're going to be talking about a little bit later on. Um, so this is all this data was taken from Dodo and um, it received quite a high uh, review on Doban uh, of 8.5 and also a fairly 
substantial amount of reviews. So in terms of timing and financial success, this film was reduced shortly at, released shortly after um, pandemic restrictions had partially been lifted in China. So whilst it may not have made as much as a pre-pandemic film, it did still manage to come out uh, on top for the releases of that weekend. Um, but I'd like to make a comparison to The Sacrifice, which is a Chinese um, war film, which was released around three months after 1917. And as you can see in comparison, The Sacrifice has a much um, higher success rate in, box, uh, in the box office. Um, so it's evident that Chinese films, even if they are kind of the same subject matter as a British film, they are still coming out on top and they are still automatically gaining large audiences in comparison to British films. So British filmmakers are having to work a lot harder to kind of gather the same amount of numbers as uh, a Chinese film. Uh, however, I do think the 1917 release date was fairly successful because if they had released it at the same time as The Sacrifice, um, I imagine that it would perhaps um, be swamped by the, the popularity of The Sacrifice and it may not have gained the attention that it deserved. So this is the first review that we've um, collected and this film praised the um, the, the tragic plot of the film, where they commented that there's not an ounce of patriotism, simply a person facing friends, enemies and strangers. So this review kind of indicates the importance of patriotism in the Chinese film, if we are to compare it to, for example, the battle at, um, at Lake Changjin. Um, and I think Chinese films maybe take more pride in their history and culture, which we could perhaps emulate in British films. However, this film does praise the individuality of 1917 in comparison to other war blockbusters. So I think this is quite interesting um, if we are to uh, think about American blockbuster films and how this review is perhaps showing a preference to British films and how it's important to um, kind of keep the British style and not emulate Hollywood for the sake of success. So this reviewer also gave the film a very good review. Um, and they commented uh, on the picture that I showed you earlier of the, um, the Chinese film poster, that the poster is better than the foreign posters of the film and it has a sense of Chinese contextual poetic beauty. So this review for me kind of highlighted the importance of marketing in a film and considering the aesthetics of how um, British filmmakers and advertisers are going to advertise this film because um, this poster clearly attracted a Chinese audience in comparison to the Western posters. So it's important to think about localization and not to produce a general product that may not appeal to specific audiences. Um, so what stood out for me in, in my research about 1917 was the appeal of a war film to a Chinese audience. And I would argue that um, in war films there's an inherent fraternity because of the interactions of the soldiers um, and how they all, all have a common goal of um, serving their country. So in my research, I discovered that according to Lima Kaiser, Men in China have often relied on the language of brotherhood to establish ties to other men. So in Chinese culture, there is this inherent fraternity, whether it's explicit or implicit. And I think perhaps um, whether this is subconscious or conscious, uh, the element of fraternity may appeal to a Chinese audience in this film. Um, and I'd like to make a comparison to the battle at Lake Changjin, which as you can see, was very successful in the box office um, statistics. Um, however, British journalists such as Phil Hode have labeled this film a propaganda war epic, which I think is very damaging to um, how, how um, our interactions with uh, China in the film industry, because 
it creates this kind of hostile conflict in the film industry. And I don't think it's, you can equate patriotism to propaganda and we need to abandon this kind of hypocrisy um, in which British films about war are just accepted. But when a Chinese, uh, when Chinese filmmakers make a war film, it's suddenly labeled as propaganda and uh, chastised by the British journalists. So I think um, thinking about what we put in the media about Chinese films will have a knock-on effect on how British films are received by Chinese people because Chinese audiences will feel more encouraged to interact with the British film industry and to watch British films. Um, yeah, so we're now going to talk about Death in the Nile, um, which in comparison to 1917 was not very successful in Doba. Um, and this first review rated it very um, poorly and it commented that although the director is British, the reviewer feels a strong American atmosphere in the work. So this reviewer is criticising the fact that the director has almost tried to emulate the American style, the Hollywood style, and they are showing a preference towards um, a, the British style, which may be um, more, it may correspond better with the fact that this uh, film is based on an Agatha Christie um, novel. So I think it's important to note that um, the British style is, it has a certain charm for a Chinese audience and they are showing preference to this over simply making a pastiche of um, Hollywood products. So the second review gave the film a slightly higher rating because they praised the fact that this um, Kenneth Branagh's um, version of the film is a politically correct rewriting, which has a multi-ethnic cast. Um, so I think with the context of this film being a um, a reproduction of Agatha Christie is very important to um, consider the political correctness because as I'm going to discuss in the later slides, Agatha Christie's work contains some of the colonial attitudes and orientalist attitudes that um, have, still have stigma attached to when you're thinking about British uh, history, which is especially important as Brit Britain has a colonial history with China and we need to tackle this head on and make sure that we are doing things such as including these multi-ethnicities in, in the cast to make sure that we are tackling our past and that we are moving forwards rather than hanging on to these colonial outlooks on film. So Decolonizing cinema was what stood out to me in, in my research on this film. And Grace Byron commented on Agatha Christie's work, calling it a melting pot of Orientalism, racism and colonialism. So it's evident that um, filmmakers need to be very careful approaching classic um, British works and they need to make sure that they're challenging imperialism, which I think can be done by still keeping the kind of quintessential Britishness, which appeals to a Chinese audience, but having a modern outlook by um, including diverse casts um, and making sure that the colonial attitudes in the works are um, addressed and not swept under the carpet. So we're now going to talk about Earth One Amazing Day, which is a, um, a nature documentary, which was produced by both a Chinese production team and a British production team. So there's already this element of cross-cultural interaction. Um, and in comparison to the uh, Death on the Nile, it has received a, uh, it has been received much better by the Chinese audience. Um, however, they, whilst they did praise the cinematography and the amazing shots of nature, 
Uh, one reviewer commented that the film feels half finished um, and that it's almost been seen before and that they believe it's been um, edited out of another film called Earth Pulse. And they said, I don't know if it's published in other countries, but it looks very much like a scam for the Chinese market. So I think for me, this emphasizes the fact that it's important to create an original project, which is um, which has been tailored to an audience rather than simply regurgitating content, which may even come across as insulting or as a lazy attempt to try and um, enter the Chinese markets. Um, and this film, I mean, this review um, had a slightly more positive outlook on the film. Uh, and it talks about how it reminded them of the fact that every day on earth is actually a magical day and that the film allowed them to see from a different perspective from the view of the animals and different creatures in the world. So I think this um, review kind of highlighted the fact that um, we need films to have a global perspective and that this idea of the twin flame and the connection um, is very important in um, shaping how British films are received by Chinese audiences. Um, so I'm now going to talk about Harry Potter, in, uh, in particular the, um, the Philosopher's Stone, which was directed by Chris Columbus. And this is um, the highest rating out of all the films that we're discussing today. And it also has the highest amount of reviews on Doban. So in addition to a lot of reviews, talking about how Harry Potter was a big part of their childhood. This reviewer um, thought that the overall message of the film was that good can always overcome evil. And they managed to draw comparisons with the message of the film to their own Chinese history, saying that the imperialists who wanted to divide China were forced to flee in the midst of popular uprisings. So Harry Potter has, the message of Harry Potter can be interpreted across different cultures and I think it's very important that the Chinese audience can view themselves in the film. And I think this is possibly why um, it's received so well in China. Um, uh, and then this review, as well as pra praising the film in general, it did point out that if the translation was better, Chinese audiences would be able to appreciate its true charm. So this film reminds me of the fact that uh, this review, sorry, reminded me of the fact that communication is key and without um, good dubbing and good translation, a Chinese audience can't even begin to appreciate the, the film. So um, I think good translation uh, really impacts the, how a film is received by a Chinese audience. Um, so in my research of Harry Potter, what stood out to me um, in terms of how it's received is that in China, there is, there's large fan culture circles and Harry Potter is a big part of these circles. And according to Xinhua Net, uh, recently China has seen a meteoric rise of fandom culture. And I think it's amazing that Harry Potter is a part of this in addition to um, Chinese films, Chinese music. Um, and people have gone as far to say that they think that Harry Potter is the start of, starting point for exposure to fantasy in China. And in these fandom circles online, um, Harry Potter even rivals Chinese classic films and Chinese classic series. So it has a great presence online and uh, which really attests to how, how well it, ha it has been received in China, especially um, by a young audience. And Alyssa Liu um, commented that uh, Harry Potter embodies the values that resonate across cultures and talks about this cultural globalization, which I think is really at the heart of why Harry Potter is appealing to so many cultures, not just um, Chinese, but across the world. It's um, a universally appealing film. And um, I think it's um, important that Britain tries to create more of these kind of films. Um, and she also goes on to say that in the 1990s, Japanese anime was the leading form of escapism for Chinese teenagers and Chinese children. 
But when Harry Potter came in, they managed to overtake this more local form of entertainment and it became the form of escapism for Chinese teenagers at the time and I imagine now. So now we're going to talk about Kingsman, uh, in particular The Secret Service, which was directed by Matthew Vaughan. And again, it's received it's been received fairly well on Doban and received a fairly substantial amount of views, uh, reviews. And in this first review, it was rated very highly. And the reviewer drew comparisons between American um, superheroes, which the reviewer almost mockingly describes as putting strange underwear on their head. So, and then it goes on to compare this to the hero who wears smart British dress, Oxford shoes and carries a civilized umbrella. So there's almost a sense of um, that the British hero is superior and uh, the Britishness of the hero is what is appealing to a Chinese audience. Um, and they kind of praise this Britishness as opposed to the almost corny American portrayal uh, of a superhero. And this reviewer goes on to um, compare this film to Wong Fei Hung um, and how this film, uh, that Kingsman has emulated the secrets of the Chinese film and the martial arts um, because in the film, one of the weapons is the umbrella, which is uh, directly reflects this film. So I don't know if the directors of Kingsman have done this on purpose, but the film has taken aspects of Chinese culture and they are both appealing to a British audience and to a Chinese audience. So I think that's one of the reasons why Kingsman has been so successful. And then finally, um, this review praised the gentlemanly style and British humour of the film, saying that they are the icing on the cake for the success. So again, it's this idea of Britishness um, that's appealing and uh, the British charm, as one of the previous reviews said, that it's important to keep this in the film um, and not to copy the American Hollywood style. This is Britishness is what makes a British film special and we should keep doing this. Um, so it was the cross-cultural connections that I thought was most important when researching this film. Um, and obviously the gentleman is at the heart of this film, but we can draw connections between the British gentleman and the Chinese gentleman, the jumpsuit, um, which Derek Hurd has commented that has, it has been re revitalized recently um, in China. So whether it is explicit or implicit, there is there are similarities between the um, core topic of the film. And I think Chinese audiences can perhaps relate to this and enjoy this portrayal. Um, and Lu Zhao Shang also says that martial arts inherit and preserve the core values of Chinese tradition. So the very fact that Kingsman has included martial arts means that it, it's automatically kind of demonstrating Chinese values in the film. And the picture that I've included on the right, I think this kind of sums up the aesthetic that has been introduced to the film, which is very reminiscent of martial arts films. And this kind of cross-cultural connection is what makes the film received, uh, be received so well by Chinese audiences. Um, so finally, we're going to talk about Sense and Sensibility, which is directed by Ang Lee, who is a Taiwanese director. And again, this film was received uh, very well on Doban. So the first reviewer gave it five out of five and said, only a Chinese director can make Jane Austen into a primetime opera. Um, so it's very interesting how Despite the it having a Chinese director, he still managed to make a Jane Austen film, which is Jane Austen is a core part of British literature and uh, kind of iconic in history. Um, 
and yet he is successful in producing a film which is both true to the story and appealing to Chinese audiences. And I think it is his Chinese background that enables him to do this. And it's great to see this kind of cross-cultural production and how it's only when cross-cultural production happens that it can so clearly um, appeal to both audiences in different cultures. Um, so, this review, um, again, it said Anjali is sympathetic to British classical culture. And it also talks about how some of the values and ideas in the film are very similar to common Chinese ideas, such as being hesitant to talk and the idea that good is rewarded against evil. So Chinese ideas and Chinese um, aesthetics run deeply through the veins of the film. And the reviewer also said that it's in the style of oriental fine brushwork. So it's very interesting how Ang Lee has used his Chinese background to even influence the design of the film, the, cin the cinematography. And I think it's really quite beautiful. Um, so finally, the again, it's the, um, the appeal of Britishness that stood out to me. Um, and upon research, I discovered that in China, there is this British style which influences um, fashion, uh, as you can see on the left. It's very reminiscent of British classical um, fashion and design. And the British Council claimed that the volume of posts relating to UK culture on the Chinese internet is second only to the US. So British culture is clearly very popular in China. And I think it is the elements of British culture in these films which um, makes them stand out and makes them um makes them be received so well in China. Um, and Alan Yarrow has commented that Chinese people are enchanted by British literary classics. So this genre in itself can be very successful, as we've seen in um Death on the Nile as an Agatha Christie production. If that had been produced um well, it would have been very successful uh, simply because of the genre. And finally, there's also, um, British actors in China are extremely popular and they're often um, given affectionate nicknames such as Benedict Cumberbatch who has been uh, named Curly Blessing by um, the fan circles. So now Leo and I are going to host a discussion um, on two questions. One is the, um, what makes a British film successful for a Chinese audience? And then secondly, how we can improve the reception of British films for Chinese audiences in the future. Um, so Leo, I'd like to ask you, what makes the British film successful with a Chinese audience? Okay, thanks Lily, your excellent introduction about the panel. And um, in terms of what make a British film successful, um, in my opinion, um, and actually, uh, before answering this question, I want to talk something about the, the, the Britishness. And you mentioned the film Harry Potter, that Harry Potter being dubbed and all the dialogues um, were, were was, uh, speaking Chinese. I remember when I first uh, watched this film in TV, in the CCTV6 channel um, in China. Um, and that at that time, I not, I not, I'm not, I was not realized that the this film was uh, was was translated, and because I I just uh, get used to it. But now I I feel that I lost a very important point, very important part of this film, which is the the British accent, and British accent is a very important in terms of the Britishness, and. One of my favorites uh, English actor is uh, uh, Colin Firth. He's the actor of Kingsman. And the reason why I like him is because of his accent. It's quite, um, it's quite clear and the uh, gentleman is quite gentle. Yes. And, and I think uh, it, it, it's lead to a question. It, and the question is, if a film being translated into, into Chinese, been dubbed, 
that we will that as Chinese audience will lost the very important parts of Britishness. But uh, if we do not, if we don't do that, that a Chinese audience will not might be they will not get access to the film, especially when they are kids, like Harry Potter, like me. So it's a question. I will leave the question to the audience. And uh, after this panel, after this discussion, and the audience can give me some advice. And for this answer, for this question, and what makes British film successful? In my opinion, a, it must be the actor and actress in the British actor and actress. And I used to have a, a experience working in a crew. Uh, it was, uh, I, I make the documentary behind the scene about the film Untamed. It was directed by Justin Chadwick um, in, um, um, in last year. And the Chinese, uh, it's a co uh, production. The Chinese producer said one word, uh, which is very famous in China. That word is, um, there's only two kinds of actors in the world. The one is British actors and the one is the others. That means the uh, Chinese audience very um, care about the British actors. And actually that experience gave me a very deep impression. Those actors are very professional and, uh, and the way they perform the, uh, the Shakespeare, your film is about Shakespeare. And the way they perform is just like they live in the 16th centuries. They're so professional, so, and, and of course they are good looking face. Uh, so I, I guess the, the reason why Chinese audience like British film, a big part of it is because of the actor and actors. So this is my answer. Thanks, Lily. Yeah, I agree with you that, um... It's the British culture that really um, stands out when uh, from with British films, and I think through the research and through looking through the reviews, um, it seemed that there was a common theme that um, when a film was trying to emulate American um, filmmaking or trying to emulate Hollywood, um, the reviewers chastised it. Whereas when it was kind of keeping this British charm um, they praised it and it was generally much more successful um, so next question is how do you think the reception of British films can be improved in the future okay um, for this question, I think the question, the answer of the question one is part of the answer of question two. And the arc actor and actors is the key weapon for, for, uh, for the British film. Um, and I also want to talk about the, something else um, in, related to my major. My major is documentary. Um, I think documentary might be a great opportunity for a British film to get, get access to Chinese markets. Um, and there's a phenomenon, you can see the box office in China. The box office been dominated by Chinese uh, mainstream film, the propaganda film, and also the, uh, the Hollywood um, film, especially the Marvel studio. Um, I think it's too hard for British films to get get access to the to uh, to compete with them, and at least in a big scale. Um, but also, it just to give up an opportunity for the for the online streaming for British film, and you can see in this situation due to the pandemic, a lot of people being locked at home, and. And they have a lot of time watching the video. And it just to give, um, and, and give me an idea that the uh, British film, um, that the market for the British, uh, British documentaries is very um, um, expectable. And also, um, Chinese audience, audience actually has not a lot about British documentary, especially the BBC production. 
And as a Chinese audience, I was grow up with the BBC production because the uh, CCTV channel has introduced a lot of them. Um, so a Chinese audience has um, know a lot about them. But um, but in terms of the some uh, uh, independence production documentary, like uh, the one I favored uh, is Sleep Furiously. The documentary is about the whales, uh, the lifestyle in Wales, the, the changing lifestyle. And actually Chinese audience know a little about them. You can, you can search this film, Sleep Furiously in Doban. Only 300 people mark they have watched it. And you can see that excellent movie had so few audience in China. So I think it probably, um, it probably a big opportunity for, for British film, British documentary, especially the independent one, to break through the blank and yeah, break the ice actually. And also um, according to my experience, the uh, uh, British and uh, all the UK, in, in the UK, uh, there's a lot of great institutes supporting uh, documentary production, like uh, British Film Institute, Scottish Documentary Institute, and a lot of film festivals like uh, uh, Edinburgh Film Festivals, Sheffield Film Festival, Glasgow Film Festivals, etc. And they have a lot of resources, but those resources have no chance to uh, get access to Chinese audience. There's no um, there there is no streaming websites to uh, access to those films to introduce to those films, and and everyone even cannot search them on website. So um, you know, and um, last year Bilibili uh, is is one of the big screen website in China. They talked to me. They want to. Um, they want to introduce some British documentaries into China. And I, and I think it's a great opportunity for them because uh, you can see in China people, um, when, when you talk to the Chinese audience about uh, documentary, they only jump out of their head. It's just uh, BBC production, CCTV production, and some uh, documentaries very famous, widely known like American one. But for the independence one, they know nothing. So it's a, I think it's a, a it's, it's opportunity for uh, improve the perception of British film in the in the area of documentary. So that's my opinion. Thanks, Lily. Yeah, I agree with you. With um, firstly with the aspect of online streaming because. I think as we've seen, um, it's very, very difficult for a British film to compete against um, both Chinese films and Hollywood films. So by utilizing uh, online streaming, I think British films will be able to reach um, a much wider range of people and also different age ranges. Um, and also with what you were saying about documentaries, I think the idea of, um, kind of focusing on smaller films, perhaps art house films, independent films, documentaries, uh, it's a very good idea because there's this idea of localization. And I think sometimes um, targeting a specific audience uh, works better than trying to tackle an entire nation with over a billion people. Um, so yeah, and it's also very interesting how, and this is something that we need to work on how, in the UK, we have the problem of we can't get hold of any Chinese films. And it seems like in China, there's the same problem that Chinese people uh, struggle to get hold of British films that are perhaps not as well known. So, um, yeah, I think we need to be um, creating more um, events on either side of the problem. Um, and I, I believe that um, I think someone in UK China films actually trying to create something like this in China. So there are people working on this and we just need to keep going. Um, so do you have anything else to say or shall we move on to the um, audience discussion? Okay. Uh, 
so now um, we're going to be accepting questions from the audience. So if you have anything to ask, please feel free to put it in the chat box and we will address them. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for Lily and Leo. It's a really helpful presentation and discussion for me because I'm from Beijing Film Academy and currently is a visiting student in University of Bristol. So, and my research is about British comedy. So yeah, the topic is quite helpful for me. And uh, I, I've got, um, I've got a, a question for Lily. As a yeah, like you mentioned, this films like Harry Potter and Kingsman, and some yeah British films is popular, indeed in China. But my question is, uh, do you think these uh, films uh, can represent Britishness uh, well? Yeah, yeah. So, so if if you can choose one or some of this, which one or some some of these films would you like to choose to represent the Britishness? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's a very interesting question because Kingsman, um, whilst it does kind of embody the almost the British stereotype, but um, in actual British life, there's not kind of gentlemen wandering around everywhere. So it, in a way that film represents more the, Brit the the foreign view of Britain than the act what actually is occurring in Britain because obviously um there's lots of different class divides in the country um and yeah but then thinking about class um I think at the start of the film uh Exy he is dressed in a way that is more working class and he then becomes this gentleman so it in a way the film does demonstrate these divides um, between class that are in Britain. So I think, yeah, if I was going to sum up which film best presents, uh, represents British values and British culture, I would say it is Kingsman because it embodies this British humour. Um, it represents some elements of our history, our style, our fashion. Um, but it also, there are some glimpses into reality with um, the inclusion of working class characters and the setting in London. Um, yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you, thank you. And I think someone asked uh, to put on a video call, so please feel free to, uh, yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Hi. Okay, okay. Uh, so I've, I've been into the session. It was very, very informative. So I have a few things to clarify with you guys. So here in India, I uh, hope you know that there are some movies uh, coming from India uh, uh, to Chinese market, like uh, 2.0. Uh, there are so, so some few movies. Maybe if you want, I can share in from my screen. Uh, so those films, what strategy they actually follow means, uh, so they wait uh, for a uh, milestone, like they produced a movie for uh, 100 crores and the movie goes up to 250 crores, they have a own milestone, after that only they release the movie in other languages and on other, other countries, like all the films, what are the mo movies he released here, all are become a blockbuster. Uh, commercial success then only it goes to other country or other language like uh, maybe it it it, uh, it could be different from different different countries but uh, what is the strategy for uh, uk or chinese to uh, release their movies in other, other in back to back countries it's like uh, on releasing on the same day or uh, 
uh, after after the response from the theatrical release um well i i think from the side of british films making it to china i was reading a bit into it and i think there's various different variables about um, how films are chosen to be displayed in China because of going back to the um, the fact that they only can show 34 films a year from international production teams. So um, I was reading about it and I think sometimes a film can be ready and set to go, but then they might discover something about the film which sets it back and they will suddenly axe it from being shown in China. Um, for example, I think it was Nomadland. Um, they were they were going to show it in China because the I think the director is part Chinese, but then they uncovered a um, an interview that they disliked. So suddenly the film was just axed from being shown in um, China. So I think the kind of method of um, getting British films into China is very unstable and there's not really a clear pathway uh, that's from just from my research I'm not entirely sure but um yeah and uh, from the Chinese to British perspective I'm unfortunately not very sure on that side of things but yeah I hope that partially answers your question okay and by the way like uh, all these uh, releases is based on the production houses like uh, reputed production houses or it's like uh, the responses from the audience Kind of. Sorry. Um. Do you, wait. Did you say is the? Did they show it because of how the audience is responding, or because? Yeah. The yeah. It reaches everywhere. Like like a, a, a Hollywood film which which, which releases, it, it automatically releases in everywhere in the world. Maybe we may maybe we can get after a week or month, but we will definitely watch in my theater. So likewise, the same uh, English film, British film goes to Chinese, right? So maybe after all the responses, they they got uh, mm -hmm. the lead to release or uh, some production companies like 21th Century Fox, Universal Pictures, all these reputed companies, they're all capable of releasing, uh, uh, spending money for uh, uh, all these uh, expenses and they can afford it to release in Chinese. So is this based on these kind of production houses or the responses for the people given in the past one month or one to two three months like um i honestly don't know too much about this but i think with british films um if you think about marvel um uh, as an american production team i think they can kind of rely on the reputation that they've built up and just the name marvel will automatically get a film um into countries like china whereas i think um British films they don't really have this big image that can um they can use to just enter the Chinese market um so I would say it probably does depend on the reception um and the kind of popularity in the country that then spurs it on to enter to the Chinese market but I I'm not an expert in this area so I don't know too much but just from my research that's what I would say yeah. Thank okay, you. For okay. the, I also believe the content of the film matters to travel every anywhere in the world. As you said, 1917 is it's a worth of a transformation of to, to the every every part of the world. In everywhere, even in India, it was a huge blockbuster in mm -hmm. theaters. So I, I believe content matters. So this is what I I think you also believe, as you said, as so far you you researched uh, so whatever the companies universal pictures are 21 parks or whatever but if the movie is is good and it works with the people it, it it can get into chinese industry right because even here in india there are uh, some films are like 150 crores 200 crores but some films are like 5 crores 2 crores films also that also dubbed in, uh, in chinese mm -hmm. so that's where i i got confused how they are allow both the uh, market like uh, lower mid, low, below more budget more film and 200 300 film budget film so 
that's where i actually confused but after your uh, answer I, i i got a clear idea only content matters mm mm-hmm. um yeah thank you for your question um i will move on to ray's question now um which is where is it um uh, so how do i think having chinese elements on the production staff will help the british film production um so i might ask actually um incorporate leo into this question since he worked on the unti- uh, untamed team and i guess leo you kind of had the experience of working with british a uh, british production team so i wonder if that's kind of the same dynamic of if if um chinese if chinese a chinese production team joined the british film production team um yeah do you have any ideas on this question so Yeah, yeah, I just want to answer this question. Thanks, Lily. Um, in the uh, in Untamed is uh, the story is about um, is uh, the story is a there's a three parts of the story. The first one is about Shakespeare. He wrote his first play, Taming of the Shrews, in 19th century, and the second part is about a um, Chinese translator, Zhu Zhenhao, translates uh, the all the uh, all the Shakespeare's work into Chinese. In 20th century, in the early 20th centuries, in the war background, in the Japanese invasion background, he lives in, he lived in uh, Shanghai. Do all, uh, have all this work done, and is is genius. Mm-hmm. And anyway, um, I think the Chinese producer want to introduce, and in, in, want to combine the two stories into together, um, is from the Chinese market concern. Um, because Chinese audience want to explore the the in uh, the Shakespeare and also the and also the British the British audience want to explore the Chinese um, Chinese uh, translator and they were curious about how they translate in the Shakespeare into Chinese. So that kind of two parts is um, is example to combine the. The Chinese and uh, uh, the UK's element into one film. So for this concern, uh, I think it worked for uh, co-production films that share the the staff and elements together. It both it, it both good for the uh, audience from both sides. Yeah. And. And for another examples, you can see a lot of um, Hollywood films has using uh, the Chinese actors. Like uh, uh, I forgot the name of the film. Some Hollywood films, a lot of Chinese and um, Chinese actors. Shang Chi, ah, uh, it's called Shang Chi, is in Tony Leung and and other Chinese background. Out, uh, actors has joined this film, so it's it's obvious that they want to explore the Chinese market, and um, I think it's good for the box office. Actually, it does. But um, for my own personal opinion, um, I don't like like to work like this way, like a uh, uh, Hollywood methods to combine. That's a little bit strange to in terms of the background and also for the. For the actor's accent is weird, so I don't like it in this way. But it's in, but it's still good for box office. So that's my answer. Thanks. Thank you, Leo. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, going back to sense and sensibility, and with uh, Angelie's input, I think it's just it really adds a new dynamic to have um, cross cultural uh, input, um, and I think it mentioned in the. Um, in one of the reviews, that Anjali kind of produces this Chinese aesthetic with the, and they compared it to brushwork, and I just think, um, I don't think you can create that dynamic by simply having a monocultural, um, a monocultural production team. Yeah, so I think uh, having a diverse range of cast produ- uh, producers, directors, it's 
it there's no way that it can have a negative impact on um production i think yeah um so i don't know if there's any more questions but um Xiao Hui has written I suppose that it is the similarities that make British film successful in China for example the tv series years and years reminds Chinese of the um what uh, yeah Harry Potter reminds Chinese of campus life friendship bravery those human common consciousness may invoke resonance yeah I think that's right I think uh yeah it's all about this seeing your own culture in these different films and um, to encourage this, um, these kind of reflections is um, very positive. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, someone else. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else. Oh, we, we're almost, uh, it's almost time to finish, I think. But yeah, if anyone else has a quick question, please feel free to drop it. Um, and if not, thank you everyone for uh, coming and thank you for watching and I hope that you enjoyed it. Thank you and thank you to Leo. Thank you, Lily. Thanks everyone. Thank you, thank you, Lily, and thank you, Mr. Leo. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. Yeah. Thank you for attending. Um, Uh, Lily, shall we stay for a while? Wait for the audience in case some some interactions. Yeah, I think so. That'll be good. Yeah. Um, I also need to figure out how to stop recording. <laughs> oh, there we go. I'll stop it now. <laughs>